Hey, this is Dave Hilster. I'm a critical thinker, science dissident. I'm here to tell you the truth about science, something your university professor won't tell you. The mass media won't tell you, and certainly these science evangelists, which I love so dearly, sarcasm, won't tell you either. Today I'm going to talk about how come we know mainstream science is wrong? How come we know the Big Bang's wrong? How come we know relativity's wrong? How, how come we know that plate tectonics is not a good theory and that expansion tectonics is much better? How do we know particle physics is a joke? Well, that's a good question. If the first thing is people will say, well, how come you guys only know? It's all political. It all has to do with nerds want to be loved. They will do whatever they can. If they have to get their position at, at MIT and repeat everything uh, that they're told, even though they don't believe it, they will do that. So I'm going to tell you how this sort of happens. Who does it and why? First of all, who finds these things out? Well, they're critical thinkers. And again, I make this distinction. I am a linguist, so I love words. I love knowing how people use words and critical thinker or engineering attitude critical thinker is a person who actually gives all alternatives a chance and realizes and will never be married to their own idea or to someone else's idea that we in science do our best to try to find the the greatest truths and when there's a problem we confront it and if we think it's bad, we throw it out. That just doesn't happen in mainstream. When you get a good science and becomes powerful and you make money at it and you can go on television and go on lecture tours and wear, make t-shirts and sell them on Facebook, you know who the people I'm talking about. It, there's not much critical thinking going on. I call them intellects. People I use the word intellect to mean people who want to appear smart. But the people who find what's truly wrong in science are not intellects. They truly give themselves a 100% chance to look at the data, look at the claims, and judge it for themselves. And if it's wrong, they give themselves 100% freedom to say, it's wrong, and I think there are better ideas, what could they be? And it isn't something easy. It's not something that comes all of a sudden. Oh, everybody finds it and every, everybody now knows something is wrong. That's not true. It's just like anything else. It's 98% perspiration, perspiration and 2% 2 inspiration. Now, how do they get this freedom? How do these people get the freedom? Well, there, a lot of them are retired. Uh, the guy from NASA, Dr. Ed Dowdy, who knows for a fact that space-time doesn't bend light, mass bends light, coronas bend light. As soon as you get out of there, there's no bending. He is now retired, and he, he works outside the mainstream much more now because he's retired and he's not tied to making a living at it. Because if you do, you can get in trouble. Well, the other way is a hobby. I work in the supercomputing department of a company. I've been working with human language and computers for over 30 years. That's my how I make a living. I do this out of the love of science. So it's my hobby. Very serious one, but it's my hobby. And then there's the other case, which is really the saddest case, sometimes the most difficult case. Our people are forced out of their jobs because of their belief that they think there's something wrong in mainstream. Now I'm going to tell you a few stories here. Uh, about these types of people. One of them is my mentor. How I got into all this is Dr. Ricardo Carazzani. He is an Argentinian physicist, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man who I have happened to meet in the uh, early 1990s. And he came by my wife's store and saw that I was an artist and a scientist and thought, hey, maybe I could help him with what he had found. And what he had found were very specific problems in special relativity way back in the early 1940s when he was in between the ages of 20 and 24 he used to argue with his professors in Argentina his physics professors about the problems he was seeing stuff that's very simple like they're applying kinetic energy equations to radioactivity 
listen to what they, that means. Radioactivity is something sitting there. There is no external external energy. Nothing's coming outside to hit it to make it come out, break apart, and radiate uh, particles and radiate energy. Energy is a concept, but radiate that. But yet they apply a kinetic energy equation to it. He started from there, and that led him on a four-year journey where he found the mathematical and conceptual flaw in special relativity. Corrected the equations, and all of a sudden he had equations that worked much better and much more simply in particle physics, for example, than particle relativistic kinematic equations. What does that mean? It means all the movements that they describe in those big particle accelerators that put relativity on it and has magic energy coming in left and right and they invent a neutrino, which is an impossible, uh, almost basically an impossible particle, and it, the story gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, Karazani had to fight everyone on that. He got his PhD in physics, but he had to go and do other things. Uh, they wouldn't accept him, of course, in, in, in physics, so he went and did other things, engineering, a brilliant man, made a living at it. He eventually retired and moved to the United States and got an experiment to try to prove what he was saying and try to prove special relativity wrong. Did the experiment, didn't come out the way he had planned. Found out years later that it wouldn't have worked because your first attempt at, a, at, a, at a, 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 an experiment almost never, never works. So he had to go through all of this. He met Alvarez, who was a person who won the Nobel Prize. And he says, look, Alvarez, look what I found. And Alvarez says, I'm too old to fight because people make their livings at it. So when that happened, he was written off. Autodynamics was written off. And then he was left to fight on his own. And then I found him. He found me years later, got me into it. And I had no qualms. I don't care. Einstein's wrong. Never thought. I always thought it was strange. Talked to my dad, too. When he took physics, he's got a degree in physics. He ended up being an electrical engineer. But he said when he heard that as you get close to the speed of light, uh, uh, mass gets bigger. <laughs> like most people, it's a, they don't tell you why. They just say it happens. So these are the people, these people looking for truth, who find a problem, find that the stupidity of applying kinetic energy equations to radioactivity. That's stupid. It's like you know, a ball that moves by itself because it's got something inside and say it's kinetic energy. It's not. Nothing came and kicked. Nothing kicks uh, radioactive material and, and kicks that stuff out of it. So that's how Karazani found, found um, and got into the idea of finding problems with relativity. He found actually started with the kinetic energy being applied to radioactivity and ended up at special relativity found that the mathematics of two frames collapsed to one that it's redundant that you would make an invention that these two frames because there's only after many many years of studying his work I can explain it to you Karazani found there's only one three-dimensional space that these idea of, of the inertial frames don't exist there's only one infinite space and you can move the origin but that's all you can't do there's not like a frame here and a frame here and a frame. Frames are artificial. And in fact, he found that they collapse, that they are mathematically redundant, and that you create an artificial situation with that. And that's what he found. Another person, I'll give you another person of example, another example of a person who is a dissident. His name is Dr. William Lucas, or Bill Lucas. Super brilliant man. He's come up with the best force equation ever in human history, the much better than the force equations uh, and unifies the forces in his equations. Although it's all mathematics, if you're into force equations, he has solved that. I always joke with him because his real story, backstory is that he was being groomed in the 1970s, early 1970s, 1970s, late 1970s, as one of the most brilliant physics minds in the United States. The United States were grooming these people. So he was one of the top people. And he decided, and they had to keep doing papers. They had to keep thinking. And, you know, critical thinker, critical, he was a critical thinker. Others weren't. They were parroting. They were looking at stuff. They're brilliant people. But he decides to criticize relativity and find the problems with it because there are many.
as soon as he was walking off the podium, his fellow students who were being groomed said, your career is over. And he was then ousted from that moment on just because he quit. You know what he says? But I'm right. You know what the guy said back to him? This is a student saying, you may be right, but you just don't do it. What? The public thinks that when there's a problem, all the scientists in the universe get together and they try to solve it. And they said, nope, there's a problem. And that's why they, they don't believe it when someone like Karazani said there's a problem or Dr. William Lucas says there's a problem. Well, when Dr. Lucas went on and started working on his own, making his own living, doing it and not, he couldn't be a physicist, he started working on his own. And he came up with a fantastic force equations that have lots of predictions about gravity and other things. Again, it isn't, a, it isn't a, in my opinion, it's not a physical model, but it's an I told him, you wouldn't have gotten there if you would have stayed in, in particle physics. You would have been doing, finding imaginary, invented particles that don't exist. Another person, uh, I'll give you another story of another person who ended up being a dissident, a critical thinker. And it's interesting because he didn't want to be. And that's Dr. James Maxwell. I talked to, him, to, to you about him. He's the guy with expansion tectonics that the Earth is expanding. Well, it turns out that he knew uh, one of the great geologists and plate tectonicists and expansion tectonicists, uh, Samuel Warren Carey. Uh, he was an Australian. Dr. James Maxwell was Australian. And what happened was as Mr. James, Mr. Um, Samuel Warren Carey was one of the great geologists, so they had to respect him, but he pushed expansion tectonics. And because of that, they sort of tolerated that and sort of, oh, you go and do that. We're not going to pay attention to it. Well, he paid a lot of attention to it. He wrote a book on it. And it turns out that before he died, he had passed the torch. He literally wrote in 1994 a letter, which you can go on James Maxwell's uh, uh, websites. I helped him with build it. Uh, one of my, my heroes, one of my the guys I, I really admire. And on there... Mr. Samuel Warren Carey says, I am passing the baton, the expansion tectonics the baton to you. Expanding Earth, they called it. And he didn't believe it, really, but he said, how can I refuse this guy because he's so famous? And so he accepted it reluctantly. And what happens? Well, he was starting to study it. I asked him, when was it the case that you finally made the decision that expansion tectonics was correct? Ouch. And he said, it was when I plotted, I took the plot of the South Pole, which starts in the middle of Africa and works its way down to Antarctica. And I put that on an expanding globe and it fit perfectly. And when you take away the seafloor bed, as you do every 10 million years strips, the earth closes down and all the continents closed together. It doesn't only fit a, Africa and South America, it only fit the entire globe closes down. Where's all the water? Well, they had shallow seas. Well, I know you're going to ask these questions. But, but the rally was, he said it wasn't until he plotted the South Pole that he became absolutely convinced. And from then on, he's been fighting the fight. He's made models. He's done incredible work on ex with expansion tectonics as it applies directly to geology. So he got into it, and now he's retired. He made a living in geology, but it wasn't so theoretical, so people let him do what he wanted to do. But he's retired. Dr. Lucas is retired. Ricardo Carazzani is retired. And as some other people, too, have been forced out. There are other stories of people being forced out. One, uh, uh, Stephen Crothers, who worked on black holes, who shows all the mathematical black holes is crazy. I mean, they, they got... They got a G in it. You have a G in an equation, the gravitational, for those people who know, when you have two bodies, you have to have two. Gravity has to have two. Gravity doesn't exist without two bodies. You have black holes, which deal with one mass, somehow has two masses magically appear in the middle of it. So he tried to show this, and in, and in Australia, in a university, he was kicked out. And now he makes a living doing whatever odd things, and he goes around the world lecturing on this. So these are the people. 
You can multiply this by between ten, five and 10,000 serious people working outside the mainstream, and there have come some amazing work. Dr. Glenn Borkert, James Maxwell, Lucas, many other people, Dr. Adominus Spencer, on and on and on and on. Great people. And that's why we know mainstream science needs a major overhaul. We don't have any ties. If you're making a living at black holes and then black holes really don't exist, they're only just dense objects, then there's a density, but they're not black holes the way general relativity says. What are you going to do? Go learn how to program and make web pages? If you've been doing this for 35 years? We have one new person in our group that said that she works around physicists who are physicists who believe in the mainstream and she says I have different ideas and they even tell her to her face we don't we you may be right this all may be a house of cards but I don't want to change my world view now so that's how and that's why we know so many things are wrong because we give ourselves a hundred percent freedom as critical thinkers to try to see what science and what the universe is with the truth and we're not married to anything. We're not married to it because a professor uh, says it's true and I have to get my PhD, so I have to parrot everything they say. I don't, I don't go on TV and, and just simply parrot everything that's been said and all this stuff that doesn't make sense because as science gets worse and worse and we get closer to a paradigm ship, it sounds like a, a religion. You get you know, multiverses and you get quantum mechanics, which is all a big joke, and all these things. And people then say it's so hard that you can't understand it, and then they make a living off of that. Sort of like Microsoft, you make it so hard and so complicated, you got to train people, and you got to those people got to be trained, and they got to be same thing. It's just a big way to make money and make a living, and they don't want to change. But there comes a time where that critical point happens, and all these things that all these people that we know, all these people I mentioned, they will become mainstream someday. And hopefully, we will change and become critical thinkers. So that's how we know things are wrong in particle physics, plate tectonics, relativity, co cosmology, the Big Bang's wrong. The universe is eternal. That's how we know. These great men, for decades and decades and decades, thousands and thousands of them, who are open to really trying to find truth without being married to anything, including their even their own theories. So that's plenty. I'm sure I went way, way long today, but it was really worth it because this is a subject that I've wanted to talk for a long time. So remember what I say. Don't take what anything anyone says on faith. Be a critical thinker. Stay critical. Stay thinking. I'm David E. Hilser, and I am your science therapist. I will cure you of your intellectualism and turn you into a critical thinker. So, ciao. For now.